Revelation chapter 9, in the chapter last week, we saw or we heard of these four trumpets, and today it's the sounding of two trumpets. Prior to the trumpets, we saw these seven seals that all of heaven was weeping and wondering, you know, who's going to open them, and suddenly you see the one who is a lamb that has been slain, and as you look at what's been happening, a lot of it has to do with natural catastrophe, earthquakes, wars, famine, death. But as these trumpets come into view or into sound, especially today here in chapter 9, we see what I would call not so much natural calamities or disasters that have to do with the earth, but I would call these more supernatural, spiritual. Focus more on mankind himself than the environment or the nature that he lives in. Not, not these earthly disasters, but these have to do with, well, with, with people, with you and I. There's a lot going on in these verses, but if you're in chapter 9, turn to the very last two verses, because here's our context. Here is kind of the meat of where this chapter's going. And before we read that, let, let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the privilege of, of being here, of getting into your word, of having the opportunity and the ability to be in your presence together and to, to just come before you and say, oh, okay, Lord, help me to open my heart, soften my heart, and receive whatever it is you have to say to me and to allow you, Lord, to, to be the one who speaks truth. So, Lord, speak to us today through this chapter 9 of the book of Revelation, and may it be something that challenges us, that encourages us, and that continues to shape and fashion us, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. So the context of the chapter, verse 20, but the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, of their sexual immorality, or their thefts. God's desire, obviously throughout this chapter, is to continue to call men and women to himself calling them to turn, to come back home, to come to him. It's like God has reached this place with the earth where he's saying, I'm trying as hard as I can. I don't know what else I can do to bring you to myself. He wants people to leave those things, and he mentions what they are that are deadly and destructive and deceptive. He talks about idols. He talks about murders. He talks about sorceries. He talks about sexual immorality and theft the things that kill, destroy, and, and really deceive. And so the heart of chapter 9 is this, this, really this justice, but also the mercy of God, calling people to come home, to repent. It's kind of like 2 Peter chapter 3. I have a couple of verses. It says, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Then it goes on to the next verse. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us. And, and this is what you see all through the book of Revelation, his, his long suffering, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's his desire, that all should come to repentance. And that's what's happening here. He's giving more opportunity, more ability for people to respond. And you know, I know men and women, they can harden their hearts. They can disregard the voice of God. 
that they can say, I don't care. I remember as a young Christian, probably all the way back to, to 1972. How, how many of you were, were born after 1972? Psh, you don't know anything. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so 1972. I've just become a Christian. I had these, all these friends who were like me, lost and, you know, long hair. And, and so I would be sharing the Lord with them, talking about Jesus and salvation and the hope of heaven. And I can remember some of my friends saying something like this. I don't want to go to heaven. I go, Why would you not want to go to heaven? And I remember specifically this one guy saying to me, I don't want to go to heaven because Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin and Jim Morrison, they're not going to be in heaven. I go, no, probably not. <laughs> they say, well, if they're not there, I don't want to go. Okay. Go for it. And people have this hard heart sometimes. And they have these reasons and these ideas. Let's, let's go back to the, the beginning of the chapter. And this is an amazing time on earth. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen, not fall, but fallen from heaven to earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. I saw a star fallen from heaven. We, we see a star in chapter 6. We see a star in chapter 8. But here he defines the star as a he, a masculine personal pronoun. To, to him, it, it's a personage, it's, it's a being. It, J John didn't see the fall. He, he, he had already fallen, but he saw the one that, who had fallen. And some say, well, this is, this is Satan. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. We have a verse, I, I thought. Oh, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nation. Some say, well, because of Isaiah, this must be the enemy. In Luke's gospel, Jesus himself says, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. But we're not sure who this star is. We know it's a, some kind of being, some kind of personage. And whoever this star is, this, this individual, they're under authority. But someone had to give them the key. They didn't have the key. They don't have the ownership of it. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 18, we have the fact of Jesus says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and death. So, so whoever has this key of the bottomless pit is someone who has, well, been given it by someone who had authority over it. And this pit is mentioned seven times in the book of Revelation, this abyss. It's also mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. And I just want to read to you a, a quick little story about it. You know this story. You're probably familiar with it. And I'm going to pick it up near the end. Jesus has made his way across the Sea of Galilee. And there's been a storm and he comes up on the shores of Gadara. You guys know this story? And there's a, there's a man there on this place called Gadara, and he's demon-possessed. And he's been put out there, and he's, he's in chains. He's, he's naked. He's been cutting himself, and no one can bind him. And so they've stuck him out there in this city on this, this area among tombs. And Jesus comes up, and he asks him, saying, what is your name? And he said, Legion. No, he didn't say it like He might have said it like that. I don't know. <laughs> he said, Legion. That was pretty good. <laughs> because many demons had entered him, and they begged him that he would not command them to go out into the abyss. We don't want to go into the abyss. And this is what gets opened in chapter 9. Now, a herd of swine was feeding there on the mountain, and it tells us that he sent them into the swine. If you, if you ever go to Israel with us, we, 
we go across the Sea of Galilee, and we, we go to Gadara. And it's, it's an interesting place. There's the hill there and the drop-off, and it's, it's uh, quite a place to stand and think about what God did in that individual's life. But anyway, uh, it's the same word here, abyss, that we find in Revelation chapter 9, the, the bottomless pit, someone call it. It's, it's like in, in Scripture, there's really there's three dimensions, uh, basically, that are defined uh, about dwelling places. There's, there's earth where we live, there's, there's heaven, and then there's what's known as the underworld. I'm not sure we understand all that and what it really is, but this, this pit is, is opened. In chapter 9, verse 2, it says, And he opened the bottomless pit. Smoke arose out of the pit, like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So you've got this, this being who has the key. He, he opens the bottomless pit, this, this abyss. And it's a global blackout, so to speak. It's this smoke and this, like, like, like it's, it's, well, it, it, it's deadly. Something evil is about to come up out of the pit, obviously, out of the smoke. And it kind of reminded me of this. I have, I have a little video I just wanted to show. That's what comes out of the pit. <laughs> Not really. I used to watch a lot of old westerns. I always like Clint Eastwood, and that music is just, make yeah, make my day. <laughs> but something worse comes out of the pit. Like we can turn the lights back up if they're not scared. <laughs> so there's this being. There's this key. There's this pit. And then it tells us here in chapter 9, Then out of the smoke, verse 3, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Scorpions, under authority, and, and they're not typical locusts, but they have the ability like the sting-like well, like a scorpion. And they were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing. So this doesn't have to do with, with you know, destroying the earth, but, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. It's, it's an interesting thing that's going on here. We know from chapter 7 that there are 144,000 who have the seal on their foreheads and they, they can't be killed. But, but when you look at verse 5, they, they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. You ever been stung by a scorpion? I was stung by a wasp once. <laughs> Actually, I was stung by a scorpion once, and I, and I don't know if you know that there are scorpions in this area. We, we had built our, our very first house, Lynn and I. It was back in 1982. It was a small little house. We couldn't afford to put grass in. We couldn't afford sod. We were, we were lucky to get a driveway. And we moved into this little house, and there was dirt everywhere. JB knows this story because he, he had the house next door, and we, neither of us could afford sod. So that's another whole story. But anyway, so I'm in the house, there's no, there's, it's all dirt, and there's ant beds, and, you know, we're trying to get this house settled, and I'm on the floor praying with this guy who was up here earlier doing the announcements, this two-year-old kid named Neil. <laughs> I'm rolling around the ground, and suddenly I feel something sting me on my shoulder. I've got a t-shirt on, I pull the t-shirt off, I throw it on the ground, and there is a scorpion with his little tail up. We got a picture of a scorpion, let me, it's like that. And he had stung me twice on my shoulder. And I didn't know we had scorpions around here. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. I grabbed my shoe, and I killed the scorpion. And Lynn is sitting there with me. And I didn't really know what to expect from the scorpion. So, so I acted like I was dizzy. And I was laying on the ground, and I fell over. And I just stopped breathing. 
And Lynn's like, John, John. Now I just lay there as long as I could. Because this is what husbands do to their wives when they're first married, right? <laughs> totally is. And then says, she goes, are you? I go, yeah, I'm fine. But scorpions hurt. And, and this one is, this, these scorpions are going to torture people for five months. And these are not typical locusts. It tells us here, they're commanded not to harm the grass. of the earth, Because locusts, as you know, they go through the fields, they eat the grass, they eat, they eat everything. We see that all through the Old Testament. But only those men who don't have the seal on their foreheads, and they're not given authority, verse 5, to kill them, but to torment them for five months, like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. So, not typical locusts. Very interesting scenario. We don't know what these locusts really are. They're, they're different. They're tormentors, so to speak. And then, then in verse 6, it says, In those days, men will seek death, but will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. That word desire is the same word as thirsting or hungering. That's the root of it, longing for. The, 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 the torment, the, the issue is so bad that they want to die, but for some reason they're unable, it seems, to take their own life. It's like Job when he was going through his situation. He wanted to die. He wanted to. They're not, and please listen, we don't know what these creatures are. You may have heard Sermons where these are helicopters with stinger missiles. This is modern aircraft. These are missiles. And, and, and we always try to take the Bible and kind of superimpose upon it, you know, our, our culture, our mindset, and try to fit it into our way of thinking and things we understand. But, but I would encourage you just to let the Bible speak and at some times let it be otherworldly or just let it be mysterious because we don't always understand it. I, I don't know. It doesn't tell us in these were, you know, helicopters. I don't know. I don't think they were. It's some kind of commanded creature that comes from the abyss and torture people so horribly, listen, that they want to die. That's what it is. They, they have a, a king over them. It says, if you look down in verse 11, they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, who in the name in Hebrew is Abaddon, which means destruction. But in the Greek, he has the name Apollyon, which means destroyer in the Greek. So you've got this king over them who's destruction and destroyer and these torturous locust creatures and as we read on, verse 7, the shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were the faces of men. They had hair like a woman's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like iron, and the sound of their wings, this, this, this crazy loud sound like chariots with many horses running into battle. So it's loud, it's, 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 it's a man's face, but it's a lion's teeth, it's a woman's hair. They had tails like scorpions, there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men for five months, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, still two more woes are coming after these things. So, so stop for a moment and just think. You got the smoke. You got the noise. Just you know, just massive sounds. You, you, you've got, you got, you got the men with, and then you've got the teeth. You've got the face, the hair, the, the iron breastplate. This is like a, 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 a horror movie, like a Stephen King nightmare kind of thing. I mean, I, I think the flood was probably insane in Noah's time. But here, they at least got to die there. Here, they're praying for it, and they can't accomplish it. 
five months of this is, is like God saying, and I mentioned this earlier, God saying is, look, uh, what do I have to do to get you to repent? What do I have to send? How, how, how do I reach you? I already sent my son to die for you on the cross, and, 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 and I've given you every opportunity, and, and, and now I'm sending this. And, and still, it seems like we read our context, chapter 9, verse 20, 21, that, that they, they wouldn't repent. They wouldn't turn. So there's these weird demonic creatures, not some natural calamity. The supernatural demonic powers ha ha have been unleashed and the purpose is not that God is cruel or brutal or harsh, but he reaches this place Or how do I bring people to their senses? How do I, how do I get them away from those things that, that destroy them and keep them from having life? And one woe is past, verse 12. And still two more woes are coming after these things. In verse 21, I jumped there, and they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. They did not repent of their murder. Violence reaches an all-time high on the planet. I would say it's pretty much reaching an all-time high in my life as I watch the news and see what's going on. Sorceries. We, we get our word pharmakia from that, which is drug use. And, and in that time, and even in our time, the, the explosion of fentanyl and cocaine and, and what people are using to kind of escape life or escape their issues, it's, it's an all-time high, not to mention the, the legal prescription drugs you can get. Sexual immorality off the charts. You probably saw this recently. Uh, the whole sexual gender thing is so crazy in the world. I saw, I saw a thing posted the other day. Teach your boys to be men because their school's going to teach them they're women. I thought, boy, that's kind of true, isn't it? And the whole thing with pornography and what people have access to and the crazy sexual world that we live in right now is so far off the charts, immorality. Anything sexual activity outside of marriage, according to the Scripture, is that which is, well, is called immorality. And it's no big deal these days. Theft, well, every area of life. Seen the housing market? <laughs> White collar? We won't even go there. You think that things have changed in our world in the last 10 or 20 years? Think, think, think as, it, as this comes into play at the end times and, and, and God is reaching out, he's shaking not only the world, now, now he's shaking people. And it says, then the sixth angel, verse 13, sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill, and this is, this is insane, a third of mankind. Now the number of the army of the horsemen were, was 200 million. I heard the number of them, and thus I saw the horses in the vision, and those who sat on them, breastplates of fiery red, uh, this blue and sulfur yellow, and the heads of the horses were, were like the heads of lions, and out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. And by these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths, for their power is in their mouth and in their tails, for their tails are like serpents having heads with them to do harm. And then our context. But the rest of mankind who were not killed, they did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons or idols or gold or silver, brass, stone, wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders, of their sorceries, their sexual immorality, or their thefts. 
The, the church, I believe, has, has been taken in chapter 4, but the Lord is revealing his justice. And we say, gosh, the Lord, th this is harsh. This is cruel. This is insane. This, this is brutal. But year after year after year in the, in the time that we're in right now, God has demonstrated his love, his mercy, his long-suffering for thousands and thousands of years. And people have taken it for granted. Now he slowly begins to reveal, as you see Revelation, it's not all at once, okay, just destroy him. It's not like the flood. God takes his time, so to speak, and it reveals the destruction the deadlines, the impact. And, and it's really the impact and, and the destruction that comes from man's disobedience, man's deception, man's denial of God's grace and God's love. I don't want anything to do with it, God. People, it says, will not repent and will not listen. And God makes every divine effort to turn hearts back to him. Every effort. He, he's their creator. He, he loves them. And no, no matter what they've done, he says, I'll take you back. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? And so you have this sixth trumpet. The six angels sounds in verse 13. I hear a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. He hears this voice. It doesn't tell us who the voice is. We don't know if it's Jesus, God the Father. We don't know if it's an angel. But it gives a command saying to a sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great Euphrates. I'm pretty sure it's not holy angels. So I never read in Scripture where holy angels are bound up by God. Nowhere in Scripture. I believe these are fallen angels, and, and they're bound, it seems, I think, since, since the time of the fall. They've been bound at this, this, this place, this, this place that's mentioned in the, concerning the Garden of Eden and, and Genesis. There's four rivers mentioned. This is the only one remaining that we know of, the rivers Euphrates. And they're bound there. It's a great divide from east from west. It's a boundary in Scripture. And they've been bound, I think, maybe since the fall. And here's the deal. If you've been bound since the fall, you're not in a good mood. These guys are not. And so it released them. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour and the day and the month and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. He mentions the hour. He mentions the day. He mentions the month. He mentions the year. And, and the structure here of this is not like it's over a long period of time this occurs but that this is a very specific year, a very specific month, if you will, a very specific day, and a very definite time. It's like, meet me, you know, January 1st, 2023, you know, uh, up at the Empire State Building up top. It's a very specific time. Not drawn out. This is when it's going to go down, and we're, we're, when these angels are released, and God has a timing. God has, has always been very uh, conscious of seasons and times and, and a calendar. And, and in fact, God says in Scripture, it's appointed unto man once to die, and God has your number. He has your hour. And these four angels, it says, will take out a third of mankind. In chapter 6, we, we saw the four horsemen, and we saw war, we saw pestilence, we saw famine, and a fourth of mankind perish. And today, I believe it says, if you, if you look it up, or there's about 8 billion people on the planet. A fourth would be 2 billion that were wiped out already, and that would be, you know, never occurred ever the history of man since the flood, and now a third more in one hour, that's two more billion. That's half the world's population. Imagine the impact. And then it says, now the number of the army, verse 16, of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. 200 million. 
You know, in 1965, how many of you were born? No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> 1965, May 25th, and U.S. News, I believe page 35, Red China had an army of 200 million men in 1965. So people say, oh, this is China. This is not China. China might be in chapter 16, but, but we'll talk about that later. If you took 200 million beings on horses and put them side by side, a mile wide, they would be 87 miles deep, almost to Panama City. This is the horde. And they've got lion's heads. This is something you want to read to your grandkids at night when they're going to sleep. <laughs> Out of their mouths came fire and smoke, brimstone. It's, it's not jets, it's not tanks, this is fallen angels, a demonic army, and, and something supernatural is going on. By, by these three plagues, it says in verse 18, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone, which came out of their mouths. And they've, they've got these tails like, like serpents. Verse 19, with heads to do harm. This is insane. This is, this is like bizarre. But, but our context is, the, even though in verse 20, the rest of mankind who were not killed, they did not repent. Now, I want you to, to, to look at verse 20 for a second. It says they did not repent. It doesn't say they could not repent. It says they will not repent. They're, they're surrendered to all kinds of things, and it mentions they're surrendered to, to idols, they're surrendered to their, their murders, they're surrendered to their sorceries, their sexual immorality, their gold, their silver, their thefts. All those things that do not produce life. All those things do, that do not bring forgiveness or fulfillment. They're surrendered to that, but they will not surrender to the Lord. They, they, they will not surrender. They will not repent. And people make all kinds of justifications. Well, God understands. Oh, my, my, my girlfriend and I, we live together. We're not married. And, and you know, we're sexually involved. But, but God understands. See, we couldn't afford to live separate. Oh. So where is that? If you can't afford to live separate, live immorally. Is that a psalm or a proverb? <laughs> I don't think it's in there. Oh, oh, God understands, I, 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 I have to, you know, take this money from my job, or, 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 or you know, I, I, I kind of do this. I know it's really theft, but God understands. I steal from my job. I steal from the Lord. I don't give. I don't tithe. They repented not. Not going to do it. Not, not going to do it, God. Not going to live in any way that you think is best for me. I'm just not going to do it. I'm not going to repent. It's the capacity, and, and we all have it, to excuse ourselves, to harden our heart, to be self-deceived. Oh, I need drugs. I need this. If you knew what my life was like, you would understand why I snort cocaine. God's Word, see, see listen, says very clearly some things are wrong and some things are right. So right now, my daughter's staying with me. I've got a, a four-year-old, a three-year-old, and a one-year-old staying in my house, not to mention my daughter and her husband. And we have a small dog who's very docile, really. He's, he's, he loves kids, but these little kids don't understand the small dog. They think they can grab his face. They think they can grab his hair. He doesn't think so. They don't understand. And, and he's a dog. Even though he's a wimpy looking little dog, he's a dog. And he's a man. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and some things are wrong. You can't grab his hair. He'll snap at you. And, and some things are wrong in Scripture, and you can't do those things if you say, you know, God, well, God says there's consequences. And, and I think all of us deep in our hearts know that it's true that some things are wrong. God has clearly defined them. I love the story. I want to read a little bit of it to you, of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. He's standing before a king. Now, Apostle Paul probably never dreamed one day he'd be standing before King Agrippa. And he has this opportunity. And he, he, he's, he's, he's a prisoner. He's got this personal experience. We've, if you're a Christian here, we all have a personal experience and a story. And so he wants to tell his story to this king. And he starts off by, by saying, and here, here's his story. At midday, it was the middle of the day, O king, and along the road I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun shining around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in Hebrew, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against those goads. And so I said, who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus who you're persecuting. Rise, stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness of those things which you have seen and the things which I have yet to reveal. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you. And here's why. And here's what he's telling King Agrippa. And here's what Paul's telling you and I. To open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified, sanctified by faith in me. Here's the reason, he said, to bring you out of darkness, out of deception, to, to bring you into to light, to offer forgiveness in your heart and your life and an inheritance of that which brings real life. Why? Because God is merciful. God's kind. God's forgiving. And in this book of Revelation, there, there reaches a point here on earth where God says, look, I'm doing everything I can now. And steal your heart's heart. It's like the story of the prodigal son. You know that story. He, he goes to his dad. There's two sons, and one goes to him and says to the younger, I want my inheritance now. And it was a shame to leave your family and your community and take your inheritance early. It's almost like saying, Dad, I wish you were dead. Give me my money and let me leave. And that's what's going down in the story of the prodigal son. He shames his father. The whole community knows it. And, and he goes off, and the, the story says, and he, he lived a riotous living. And when he had spent all the money, you know the story, this young Jewish boy ends up with the worst job a Jew could possibly have. He's feeding pigs and eating the food of the pigs because nobody would give him anything. And so he realized, he goes, you know, my dad wasn't that bad of a guy, actually. I don't know why I left. In fact, my dad is such a nice guy. I bet if I went back, he would make me like one of his hired servants. He would probably give me a job. I wouldn't be feeding pigs, not in a Jewish home. I could go back. My dad's that kind of guy that he, he would probably at least let me work there. He wouldn't take me back as a son, you know, give me another inheritance. But, hey, I think I'll make my way back. And he began to think of his story and how he would entreat his dad. He knew his dad was kind and merciful. But he had no idea how kind and merciful his dad really was as he makes his way back. Because his dad had been looking for him every day. I hope my son comes home. You know this is the story of God the Father. And he's waiting, he's waiting, he's looking. And finally one day over the hill comes that familiar walk. And I think most dads could recognize their son from a long way off. And he sees him. And he runs to him. He's probably thinking, I, I have no idea what the son's thinking. Oh, my gosh, here he comes. And he hugs him. He gives him a ring, and he starts to say, Dad, hey, I, if only I could. No, stop. 
You're not a hired servant. This is my son. He puts a robe on him, puts sandals on his feet. Obviously, he was pretty destitute. He says, you know what? Tonight, we're going to have the biggest party we've ever had. We're going to kill the fatted calf. My son, who once was dead, is now alive. Because God is merciful. God is kind. God is forgiving. God has done everything he can possibly do. And in our chapter today, it says, but they would not repent. It, it tells us, you know, that, 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 well, let me take you back to, if you have a Bible, look all the way with me to the back of Revelation, to the end of this story in chapter 22. We're almost finished. Kind of, kind of look at the heart of God when past all this craziness that happens. Right towards the end, verse 17 of chapter 22, and the spirit, God's spirit, and the bride, which is the church, and let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. It, it carries the context there of, of, of in verse 22, I mean, in verse 17. Let him who, di- let him who hears, let him who thirsts. That, that word thirst there basically also means those who are undeserved. All those who are undeservingly, uh, you know, uh, any, anyone can come, he says, and drink. Today, you and I, by the Lord, and through his spirit, and from his bride, if you're thirsty, he says, come and drink. And the book of Revelation is all about his, his, his justice but also all about his mercy. And a lot of people are are living life and and they're very thirsty and they're trying to quench that thirst with all kinds of things. And they're they're mentioned in our chapter today with, with drugs, with sex, with theft, with murder if need be, with violence. And the Lord offers a new start something missing inside. Come and drink, he says. Some kind of loneliness, and, and even though you may have friends and all kinds of family, so, something about it, I, I just always feel like I'm lonely or I, I'm not fulfilled, I'm not content, uh, I have a fear of death or whatever it might be. He says, let, let anyone who, who thirsts come. He's the father who waits at the end of the road. And, 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 and yet there are still those, as we see in our chapter today, that will not. Not that they cannot. They just will not. And, and maybe you're here today and, and, and the Christ has been knocking on your door. Been calling you to himself. Not about church. It's, it's not about, you know, some kind of card you sign. It, it's about a personal relationship with Jesus Christ who says, come to me. All you who labor and heavy laden, I'll give you the rest you're looking for. Come, drink. Those who are thirsty. Maybe you're a prodigal like this prodigal in the story who said, you know, I, I don't need God. I'm going to go do my own thing. And you find out, boy, I, I do. And you can come home. It's not that you can't. Many times it's that you won't. And he comes again and again again. And again, in fact, the book of Revelation is all about God spreading out this timeline where finally he says, you know what, I've done everything I know to possibly do to mankind to get him to come, and he will not. Well, we live in a time right now of grace. There will be a time of justice and grace, 
But right now, I would submit to you that the grace door is pretty wide open. And the scripture says, whosoever will may come. And maybe you're one of the whosoever's today. I don't know. 